friends, uh, welcome to Grace Community Church. My name is Scott Barber, and I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here. And uh, we're moving on in our worship service here to the Word of God. God is good, amen? God is good, amen? amen? That's what I'm talking about. Blow what hair I have back. Push it back, way back. It's good to see y'all. It's good to be with y'all. To love on Jesus together. We love God's word. We know it's power for our lives to change us and transform us. And so uh, we have this thing called the word of the week, uh, where we reflect on a, the, a, a word or a passage throughout the week that relates to our sermon. And uh, uh, if we're brave enough, we might even recite it here in the service. So do we have any of those brave souls, any brave souls here today who want to recite uh, God's word of the week for us today? Marge. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marge. Thank you. So take note in your bulletins. We got this week's Word of the Week in there as well as next week. So take note of next week's Word of the Week. Put that someplace where you can reflect on that, meditate on that. We'll have it posted on, on Facebook. We try to get it in front of you in all kinds of different ways so you don't have to forget about it. Um, or you can choose to remember it, whatever, however you want to put that. Well, for those of you who are uh, checking out Grace here, maybe for the first time, we're here last week, we started a series called entitled 24, and yes, we did, uh, we did pull that off of the TV show 24. Uh, we're not quite as cool, I'm not quite as cool as Jack Bauer, but Jesus is very cool, much cooler than Jack Bauer, amen? amen. All right, and he is, uh, he's definitely uh, more legit uh, than Jack Bauer. Uh, but like in the series 24... Uh, the series, uh, each episode is an hour breakdown countdown uh, towards imminent danger where lives are going to be lost. And, and so in, in each episode, it counts Jack Bauer and his team uh, 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 trying to save the lives of many from evil and terror. In and throughout Jack's uh, uh, course of, of, of action and mission, on a number of occasions, he's even faced... Betrayal by his own team members. Team members turn or are used by the enemy. By the enemy or the terrorist groups to infiltrate and sabotage his plans. Well, as I mentioned, Jesus is far, far greater than Jack Bauer. And in our series here, we are walking through the episodes, if you will, that count down and move towards Jesus' culmination of his purpose of coming to earth, and that was to die in our place on the cross. It's the countdown to Calvary is our series. And we're unpacking each of the, in each of these episodes, if I can put it that way, that the Gospel of Luke recounts the critical aspects of Jesus' saving work for us. Today's passage uh, or episode, if I can entitle that, if you will, is out of Luke chapter 22, verse 47 through 62. So if you have a Bible or Bible app, you can turn there. We have Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you there if you want to follow along. Again, uh, Liz, our rock star admin assistant, has been uh, loading things on the Bible app if you want to follow along that way and do your sermon notes that way. Which Bible in the Bible app? Which app? U version Bible app. Yep, U version Bible app. Good, good, good question. Yeah. So previously, before we jump into uh, 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 that scripture, there previously on twenty four uh, in our sermon series here last week, we saw Jesus facing temptation in agony, in the worst possible ways. He was being tempted to deviate from the plan that he and God had set out from eternity past. And that would be for him to come and face the wrath of God in our place for our sin. Jesus also prepares his disciples to face temptation, telling them to pray that they would not give in. They would not succumb to this temptation. Last week we saw Jesus' victory, his triumph over temptation means for us power. Power in the midst of facing temptation now because of his victory. In addition, we have victory 
when we follow his footsteps in praying like him to the Father, your will be done, not mine. That episode, the preparation for temptation, leads us into our passage for today. Jesus tells his disciples, pray so you won't give in. Unfortunately, the temptation will be so great, and it comes here and now, and his disciples, they'll give in. They'll fail, and they will sin, and they will fall away. Let me pray. Jesus, as we come to your word here and now, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts, spirit, to see ourselves in your word, to let your word expose ourselves this morning, Lord Jesus. Spirit, come upon us in power, Lord God, that we would be able to see your love in ways we've never seen it before because we will see ourselves in ways maybe we've never seen, allowed ourselves to see before. Spirit, open my heart. Come upon me to teach your word and to speak your word. And Jesus, change me, Lord God. Change me. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's jump in here. Let's read verses 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, have you come out against us? Again, excuse me, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So Jesus and his disciples are in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has been praying. He's been telling the disciples to pray. Here it comes. The temptation is coming. They didn't know exactly what that would be and what it would be like, but Jesus knew that they were going to be tempted. Tempted to fall away. Tempted to abandon him. Tempted to betray even. We see Judas here approaching in the garden. One of the twelve, in verse 47 it says, was leading the crowd, and he drew near to kiss Jesus. Let's provide and pause here to give some backstory to, the, to where we're at in, in uh, the storyline. Here's Jesus approaches death. Earlier that evening, earlier that day, in fact, Judas had gone to the chief priests and teachers of the law, as Luke records earlier in chapter 22, in order to sell out Jesus. It says Satan entered into Judas. Now, we don't want to misunderstand this language to suggest that Judas was somehow possessed by a demon, if you will. But he was being under the influence of Satan, and he had willingly, he's not under Satan's control, he willingly allows Satan to lead him to be a betrayer of Jesus. Why was it necessary for for Judas, or for there to be a betrayer uh, for this to happen. Well, you see, it, the people of Jerusalem and the crowds loved Jesus because of the power and his miracles, and the chief priests, the teachers of the law, they'd been plotting against him. They'd been wanting to take him down to silence him, and they couldn't do it during the day. Judas was a person who knew Jesus' rhythms, and every year on Passover, After they would celebrate it, Jesus would go to the same place to pray with his men, with his disciples. So it was necessary for there to be a betrayer to to lead them to where Jesus would be 
during that evening in the dark where nobody else would know where they were. Judas, whose heart was cold even before this moment where Satan had come in. The Gospels tell us that he would even take money from the purse. He was in charge of being a treasurer for the ministry of Jesus and the disciples, and he would, he would take a little bit for himself. His heart was already hard. The love of money had gripped it, and he was vulnerable. He was weak, and he gave in. Jesus, during the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the, the beginning or instituting of it for us, which we're celebrating here today, he calls out that someone will betray him. He says, the Son of Man goes that has been de determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. The hand of him who betrays me is with me at this table. Jesus calls him out. Jesus knows that he's going to be betrayed. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. Jesus, or Judas denies it, though, when he's called out in front of the other disciples. In the other gospels, he denies that he is even part of this, that, that this is his plan or, or, or of action on his part. And after the supper is over, he slips out in order to, to do his dirty work, if you will. And he comes back into the picture here with the crowd leading them. And the irony here, as Jesus asks Judas the question, he draws out, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas had been with Jesus for three years. He knew Jesus' ministry. He knew the compassion of Jesus. He's seen the miracles of Jesus. It was undeniable who Jesus was. He experienced all that firsthand up close. He saw the consistency of Jesus' life. And a kiss of all things, which Jesus explained earlier in Luke, was a sign of friendship, of love, of welcome. Of all signs he would choose to indicate, this is the man. This is Jesus. He would choose a kiss. It's a great irony. Jesus' response to him, this question, even in the midst of all this, even in the midst of Judas' betrayal, as one of his own twelve, it's not a shock to Jesus. But his question here in verse 48, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? His question, as Alistair Bagg, <clears throat> preacher and scholar, states, is a question of compassion. It's a question of love. It's an invitation to conviction one last time. Are you going to give in? Are you really going to give in? After all you've seen, the Son of Man, you know who I am. You've experienced my love. Turn. Take this moment and turn. Judas betrays Jesus, but Jesus loves him anyway. Well, Jesus wasn't the only one who was part of this plan here. We have the crowd as well. We have the crowd here that he led to Jesus, that sought to terminate Jesus. But as we'll see here, Jesus loved them anyway as well. The crowd being, as we see in verse 52, was made up of the chief priests, the officers of the temple, the elders. These were the spiritual leaders. They needed Judas, as I mentioned earlier. They needed somebody to, to identify Jesus. You know, these gardens weren't like our parks here today where they have lights, all right? You know, it's kind of like you think of, of, uh, of a bonfire you have with your friends out in the woods or, or out, on the, out on the farm. There's, there's not a lot of lights out there, and, and you, you, need, you need to be wary of who you're next to because you may assume that they are someone they are not, maybe your spouse even, and snuggle up and be embarrassed. All right? They needed Judas 
to identify in the midst of the darkness Jesus to make sure they got the right guy because they sought to silence Jesus. He was claiming to be the Son of God, the Son of Man. He made all these threatening kinds of statements that he could forgive sin as if he was God's Son, who he was. Jesus came to save them even in their sin. But they rejected him. They sought to silence him. For months, if not years, they had the opportunity to do so. As Jesus calls them out in, in, uh, in verse 52 and 53, you came out here with swords and clubs. The, you, you know the kind of ministry I have. I'm a vulnerable person. You come out here as if I'm, there's going to be violence. And if, if I'm going to re resist arrest, when all the time you had the chance to take me. Jesus' words here indicate you're not taking me. You're not overtaking me. Just like with Judas, he may betray him, but I go willingly. I'm going on my own power. In fact, this was all part of my plan. Jesus is fully in control here. This isn't a surprise. He's not a victim. It's all part of his plan. But they're being used also by the enemy. This is your hour, the power of darkness. They, are, they have given themselves over willingly to the work of the enemy to oppose God himself and his plan of salvation. Now, the response to the crowd here, we have two responses, the disciples and Jesus' response. The disciples will re respond kind of like how we would. They, we've got these people coming in. They're going to attack our leader, who we believe is the king of kings. And they come in. They got swords. They got clubs. And so we're going to react. We're going to defend. And so we have one of the disciples pull out a sword and strike the servant of a high priest, cutting off his ear. It wasn't very good aim. And disciples weren't really, uh, really well-prepared uh, warriors, if you will. We know from other passages that this person was Peter. Ready, fire, aim, Peter. The disciples react in anger, in defensiveness, in vengeance, if you will, giving in to that temptation. But look at Jesus' response. He corrects his disciples. No more of this. And then the would-be enemy, part of the crowd, seeking to seize Jesus, seeking to terminate Jesus, he kneels down and he touches his ear and he heals and restores him. In this very simple act, miraculous act, Jesus com communicates his consistent grace and mercy and love. The crowd sought to, determine, to terminate Jesus, to silence him. But Jesus loved them anyways. Well, the story continues on here. It's not just Judas, who we knew all along would betray Jesus. It's not just the crowd, who we knew all along opposed Jesus, through his ministry, the chief priests and the elders. But it gets closer and closer to his inner circle. Verse 54, jump in there with me. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him at as he sat in the light, looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You're also one of them. But Jesus said, But Peter said, Excuse me, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, Certainly, this man was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know him. I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. And how he had said to him, 
before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter, being a man of passion, ambition, and boldness, great deal of self-confidence, if you will. He pulled out that sword to defend Jesus. He followed Jesus in the crowd, being very close to him as they got even to the priest's house where Jesus would be mocked and beaten in his interrogation. The pressure, temptation. As close as he was, he crumbled. Let's rewind here to understand even greater the context of what's going on. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, Peter was the one who responded to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? He's, and he said flat out, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. He knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world. He knew it here. He could see it. He understood who Jesus was altogether. At that night, earlier in the evening, after the Lord's Supper, after the Passover, the disciples fall into their common struggle of of playing the game, who's the greatest? And I can't imagine how this conversation would go, but they're all uh, uh, competing with each other about who's the greatest disciples. And I don't know if they're like flexing or doing push-ups or I- I'm not sure if they're opening their scrolls and, and uh, reciting Leviticus because it's ridiculously boring. I don't know how they would be determining who's the greatest here, but they're going at each other with some kind of competition And Jesus goes into explaining to Simon, Satan, Satan wants to take you. And I imagine it was much like, much like Judas. He wants to take you, but I prayed for you. And Peter says to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Mm, Bring it on. I'm your man. Jesus, Peter was full of all kinds of this bravado and self-confidence in himself. He didn't have a right understanding of his own heart. Jesus foretold, Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to deny me. We walk through this, this scenario. Three times he's asked, you were with him. You know the man. You got that Galilean northern accent, you betcha. You were with him. And every time, no way, no way. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this dude. I don't know this man. And all this time, I don't know if you caught this, but Peter is in the presence of Jesus the entire time. He's just within eye shot, ear shot. Jesus is there the entire time. Peter knows it. And he turns his back and denies him. Peter dominates the scene here in these verses, but all it takes is, is a few words where, where Jesus is inserted and we see that, 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 that Jesus was all over this. Verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I believe in these words, there's there's an immense amount of compassion. Peter, we see, remembers Jesus' words about his denial, but there was more there. Jesus says to Peter earlier that night, you're going to betray me, but when you turn again, because I'm going to bring you back, when you turn again, Restore the others. Restore the others. In verse 32. Peter denies Jesus, but Jesus loved him anyways. 
Peter knew Jesus is teaching earlier. Luke 12 records this. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. That's heavy stuff. Peter just denied Jesus before men. But Jesus promised him grace. You're going to come back. That look at Peter in that moment, I truly believe, was a look of mercy and grace. You've left me, but I've not left you. Peter is broken. All at once, Peter finally sees himself for who he is. He weeps bitterly. I believe this is me, but I believe this strongly that this is Peter's conversion moment. And it's at this moment that Peter, he knew who Jesus was. He knew he was the Messiah. He could tell that. But he hadn't fully come to grips with that he was a sinner and he was a savior. He needed Jesus, not Jesus. To be a savior of his own sin in his life. For the first time, Peter comes to grips with his own depravity that he would reject his savior. He would oppose him and turn his back on him. It's only this point here after this point, that Peter's heart is so transformed. And because of his restoration and the love of Jesus, he understands the cross, I believe, initially better than any of the other disciples, which explains his boldness in Acts. Why he's willing to risk it all. Because he knows how much he is loved by his Savior. Because he knows how deep and depraved his sinful heart is. The innocence of Jesus in all of these relational accounts, whether it's with Judas, with the crowd, with Peter, his innocence, his, his love that persists, his undeserving uh, uh, of, of any kind of betrayal or opposition, abandonment, is contrasted starkly with the actions of, and the relations of all these principal characters here. In all their actions, Jesus loved anyway. Friends, we are, we are Peter. We are Judas. And we are the crowd. This may seem like, hold on, that seems like an overstatement. You're, you're reading some things into here, this. Let me make a point here, and I'm going to unpack this. Just like with Peter, he didn't understand the good news until he came to grips with the bad news. There is no good news of the gospel, of the saving work of Jesus Christ and his love, if we don't come to grips with the reality of the condition of our own hearts, our sinfulness, the depravity of our hearts and our souls. Look with me here. The, memory, the, the, the word of the week captures this. Romans 5 Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now, have, that we are, now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Notice in these words here, while we were enemies. The scriptures label us, all of us in our sin are enemies of the gospel, enemies of Jesus, enemies of God. Now John Piper explains that this may not be that we're consciously on a war path out chanting, kill God. It's far more subtle than that. It's, it's more of a quiet insubordination. I want my way, not yours. An indifference to the work of God. Romans 8, Paul captures this. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You hear that? The sinful mind, this is natural to every single one of us, is hostile to God. 
And later John would go on to say these words that whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. And we might say, holy cow, woo, this is, this is pretty dramatic stuff here. But it's black and white, friends. In our sin, we are, other, we are under the power and we follow the work of the enemy, which is in rebellion against God. Or we are saved and we are for Jesus and we love him as our Lord and Savior and want his way above all. It's black and white. In our white lies, to cover ourselves from any kinds of consequences, it's a rebellion, it's a state of re- statement of rebellion against God of, no, I want my way, not your way. I'm not going to trust you. I'm going to do things my way. When we... M- misreport our hours or uh, at work or, 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 or lie or if we neglect the poor, if we engage in some lustful activity, whether it's through pornography or some lustful gaze of our, of our heart at, at, at a lady man, if we have a bitter thought, if we cut somebody down with our comments, if we're unwilling to hold, to offer forgiveness and be reconciled in relationships, and whatever it may be, all of these expressions our statement of, my way is better than your way. Ultimately, that's a statement of, I'm choosing Satan's way, because that's his way, rather than your way, God. All sin is rebellion against God. All sin is an expression, crucify him. Crucify him. For some of you, this may be the first time that... your heart, your spiritual condition, your actions have been put into this extreme kind of light. But I truly believe this, friend, in order for us to truly experience salvation and to understand the love of God, that we have to acknowledge and come to grips with the depravity of our hearts, with our sin. You can't know how much God loves you and what it meant for him to die on the cross in your place. If you don't realize your sin put him there, and it was because of your sin he willingly put himself in your place to take hell for you. If we don't come to grips with it, our sense of God's love is really in a sense of entitlement. That we're his creation, and we deserve to experience his love. He's supposed to come and die for us. This is where Peter got right, but Judas didn't. Judas never repented. Judas never acknowledged his sin. He killed himself in shame, not out of conviction. Peter was convicted. He saw himself for what he was, and he turned. He came back, and he was restored. We want to jump so quickly to the love of God, friends. But we can't know it. We won't understand it. We won't be overwhelmed by it. And we certainly won't be changed until we know that we don't deserve it. Until we know that we were enemies. We are hostile. We were Peter. We were Judas. We were the crowd. When we understand that, then his love, the fact that he loved us anyways, is a rush like none other. It's a wave, a tidal wave that can't be stopped in your heart and your life. It will break you and carry you away. While you were a sinner, he died for you. While you were his enemy, he pursued you and embraced you with his bloody arms. While you nailed him to the cross, he loved you anyway. And while in your sin you yell crucify, he says, Father, forgive him. Forgive her. As we go into communion here today, we're going to be, I'm going to be sharing with you guys a song by Sidewalk Prophets called You Love Me Anyway. And, and many of you have probably heard it on the radio. And he says this line in the bridge, I'm a thorn in your crown, but you love me anyway. I'm the sweat from your brow, but you love me anyway. I'm the nail in your wrist, but you loved me anyway. I am Judas's kiss, but you loved me anyway. 
See now, I am the man who yelled out from the crowd, for your blood to be spilled on this earth-shaking ground. Yes, then I turned away with a smile on my face, with this sin in my heart, tried to bury your grace. We have communion today as, as application, if you will, the message. As we come before the king, how do we respond? Jesus laid out that my, my body, this bread represents my body broken for you. This cup represents my blood shed for you. Come. Recognize your need for me to feed on my work for you. Recognize your sin for what it is and receive my gift. Let me wash you clean. Come to the table. Come to the table. We have a choice today. With the table set before us of, Lord, of the Lord's Supper, Judas, when he was called out to betray, he left the table. When he was called out for his sin, for what it was, he did not stay and remain with Jesus. Peter remained. Peter, even when he turned away, returned back and came back to the table. You have a choice. How are you going to respond? Just because you go back and take the elements, the bread and the cup, doesn't mean that you're actually dealing with your heart and your sin. Don't do that just to cover up just because everybody else is. Be honest. If you are not willing to acknowledge your sin and your need for Christ, your sin and what it is in opposition to God, let it pass you by. Friends, if you're willing, if you're willing to be like Peter, you're willing to let the Spirit take you and see your heart for what it is, to let you see your sin for what it is, in order to see his love, for how amazing it is. Come. The table. The table is open. And maybe this is the first time for you. Come. Come to the table. Stay. For eternity. Whatever you've done, he loved you anyway. Receive that love today. Let me pray. Father God, it's a heavy word today. And Satan would be, will be, and is at work right now to harden hearts like he did Judas. That he would not see and acknowledge his sin for what it was. But God, may we be like Peter. May we be broken. May we come and may we stay at your table. Not because of what we've done, but because of what you did. But because of your love is so good, it's better than life. Your love is so great that you pursued us and, and let us be swept up in your arms as your enemies opposing you on our sin. And let us feel your embrace for the first time maybe or afresh again as we receive your body taking hell for us as we receive your blood washing us and making us new. And as we are called sons and daughters, family. In your name we pray. Amen.